Welcome to Turn Right Machine Works. My name is Keith. Yesterday afternoon, we got a call about three, about three o'clock in the afternoon. I was uh, just coming back from Truro. Uh, did a little job down on a on a crane down there, and um, this this customer of mine called me on the phone and, and said, "Are you busy right now?" I said, "Well, I'm just unloading the truck and everything else." He says, "I got an inside job for you," <laughs> and. Uh, uh, and, I, and I did have to laugh because actually when I was working down on the crane there, uh, I had my portable walling uh, trailer, truck and everything else and I rolled inside the building, we closed the door uh, and, and I was in a heated building, heated floor and uh, it was pretty comfortable, it wasn't even like working outside. Anyhow, back to this project here, the customer uh, said, hey, uh, my, my tree tripper uh, um, came apart on me and uh, he had um, pretty well pulled it apart. He's got everything all cleaned up uh, you know, on it. He knows that uh, you know, I don't like the greasy parts and stuff like that coming in here. I don't have a parts washer, that type of thing. Um, he gave me some dimensions on the phone and I immediately jumped in and, and called the material supply so that we could act on this job uh, very quickly. Uh, this is, uh, you know, that was Friday, three o'clock, um, and now we're on Saturday, Sunday. Um, we're gonna, you know, I'm just trying to fill in uh, some time here uh, in between, trying to get them back in action as fast as possible. Now, I uh, when I called and was inquiring about material, my first choice was 4130 and chromium molybdenum steel, and uh, it, and you can you can weld to it, machine it, and it's very uh, friendly and uh, easy to work, and also it would ensure that we'd be putting a uh, a stout piece of material. You can't just build a shaft like this out of regular mild steel. Um, so it does have to be an alloy. Uh, there wasn't able to come up with a piece of 4130 for me, so my second choice is 8620. Now 8620 is the same thing as, except for it has nickel added into it and uh, very weldable, very machinable. Uh, you can also case harden it. We're not we're not worrying about that. Uh, you know, I've taken the file and, and filed into here. We don't have a need to actually have an outside hardened surface on it, but we do want to increase the yield and uh, the the basic overall strength of the material. Now we will have to go through a normalizing or stress relieving. Um, uh, we're going to do a local stress relief normalizing right at the weld points on this thing when we get done welding the hub. Now this is broken three parts and it's actually stacked up here so that I can get length measurements right off the table here and I can put a parallel up here we're basically about 37 and 5 eighths of an inch diameter the, I mean length and the mean diameter is 4 inch and we have a piece of 4 and 3 quarter inch A620 at uh, 38 inches long so uh, maybe just a little bit longer. So so I'm just kind of like looking at different parts and of course you would think if it was going to break on one side or the other of this flange that it would just like break clean and that flange would be stuck to one side or not. But it actually broke both of these welds right here. One was broken a lot longer and it's, it fret and wore a lot right here. And that's where that crack went completely across here. This stuck inside here for a while. It, it didn't stick long or, or hard because this is 100,000 smaller than this bore. For some reason, somebody had excess plate between that plate and, and this diameter right here. So this plate was actually driving and was physically only connected by those welds in those areas. And that is probably the only thing that I could actually find. This customer is a, 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 a rare uh, customer. He, he actually come in and he'll actually tell you if he destroyed something. You know, I, I, I've been in the marine trade for... Uh, 37 years or so better than that now and and I see propellers coming in marine shafting stuff like that only about 1% of the boat owners will actually come in here and tell you that they they uh, they did the ding on their prop or whatever 
Uh, you know, it, it's a <laughs> it's known that the ship will go down with the captain, but he doesn't have to take blame for his damage. So, um, you know, my mother did it, my sister did it, my brother, uh, my uncle. Um, uh, I had I had somebody borrow the boat. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyhow, back to the. Uh, this project here um, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna get the four jaw like I was saying in there we're gonna get the flange up here and there's there's a shoulder and, there, and face on the other side of this flange here and these two diameters right here have got to run concentric with this with this shaft as well so we're gonna be roughing out the material we're gonna be prepping this we're gonna get these two welded together and then we'll be doing the final turning because we need to register these two up here. We can have a little bit out on this face and we can re-skim this face, but this peripheral diameter right here that's going to be holding this the drum with the knives and everything else that's on this chipper, uh, this, this thing spins up about 2,000 RPMs and it's got to be uh, running pretty damn true. And uh, and that's the name of the, you know, that's the goal that we're up against right now. So this is kind of the, the project. And uh, we're going to go ahead and get some more dimensions. Check out our shoulder. We got some radiuses come in here. On this other end here, it looks like there's a ring or a collar put on where the bearing might come. I don't know if there's thrust. And that ring might be put on because there's supposed to be a radius in there. This is a sharp shoulder here. But underneath here might actually be formed a radius so that the strength, those kind of things right there are what creates strength. So it's kind of what we got going on right now and uh, that the only reason or the only thing that I could find that would cause this thing to break right across right underneath this wallet area right here is there was a hundred thousand clearance in between this and the bore so it's it was rattling in here pretty good all right now you can see the snap you know that snapped pretty good all right now, you know, I said, well, you know, it came apart with that wall right there, okay? That's a hundred thousandths clearance between that bore. And th th those bores are, 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 you know, they're not, it's not like this thing spun in there and that made that bore that much clearance. Because it looks nice and true on both parts and it's almost exactly one hundred thousandths oversized. So, I think... I think basically somebody made the mistake of the diameter and they went ahead and they walled this thing together. And uh, you know, I think that's part of the problem why this thing actually broke. Our job is to get them back and running and we're going to start by roughing out the shaft we have here. All right, I, I grabbed the camera by hand here so I can bring you in and close and uh, you can see this lighter color area right in the center here. Um, that The lighter color shows newer break, okay? Of course, it got down to this little piece right here in the very center right here and that's where it kind of like snapped off all at once. But it did get in here and was breaking uh, pretty close to from that ring on into the center there almost like the rings of a tree uh, Kind of showing you the age of breaking somewhere around the outside edge where that wall uh, Was underneath that clearance or the gap in between the hub and the shaft was a uh, a Section of wall that was that was a stress rise area and that's probably where the crack actually started to pinpoint it it would be very very hard to pinpoint exactly where around this edge around this edge right here it'd be pretty hard to tell exactly where it did start or originate and then here's here's looking at that meat to what you actually saw over there and you know that you can see all of this area around here is dark it was it'd been broke for a while um, and, and who knows it's just like a propeller shaft you'll look at the broken end of a propeller shaft and the darkest area is where the cut or the break starts and most of the time you'll see that dark area right next to the keyway and then it and it gets lighter and lighter and lighter till you hit an area where it actually snapped the the piece right off at the end 
that's kind of what the break is and that's why I only I you know I can only say you know you look at this diameter this is not spun this is this is a true finished diameter and it looks pretty good move my coffee cup here and this is the inside of the bore I mean it's not rolling or scraping or whatever there's a little raised ma materials right there um, that was that was underneath there but that's virgin bore so to me they assemble this thing with almost a hundred thousandths clearance between the flange and the shaft and then welded it alright this is the butt end of the stock where you know they cut us off a piece and this was the rough end of the the bar itself and uh, originally this was probably a 14 foot bar it looks like 14 and one foot and this is four and three quarter inch diameter 86 20. now we're going to go ahead and we're going to take our sanding disc here and we're going to go ahead and just give us a new surface right here take off this rough edge right here and we're going to take our square with the v ed, uh, um, V attachment there so we can scribe a center line here um, we're going to do both ends but we're going to do this one here first and we're going to drill a center center hole in each end so that we can put this thing up in the lathe and we're going to run it first off in the three jaw and uh, we're going to go ahead and, and create a semi true running round diameter and then after that we're going to go ahead and switch over to our four jaw and we'll be able to finish off the job in the four jaw Okay, now the reason why I give it semi-finished like that in the center is so that my layout lines will be pretty true. And this is such a rough cut here, it would tend to want to steer your center drill off. So, anyhow, so we're going to take our Sharpie and we're going to create a little dicum surface right here. And we'll let that dry. We'll go get our, our V and our blade and scribe and we're going to lay out the center. Okay, we've got our um, Mitch Toyo blade, and it really, we're not really worried about or interested in what increments or or uh, the scale itself. All we want to do is have a section of it right there mounted in our V so that we can have straight scribed lines. All right, and you put your V against your material like this and hold your blade down firm, and you give a pull with your scribe and create a scribed line that's almost uh, 90 degrees from each other and then I kind of like put a 45 in here and you can do it one more time so you basically got four lines that intersect at a point right there and then we go ahead and we take a center punch and create a center punch there I like a light tap make sure that I'm on center if it looks like it's a little off I can steer it and then send it home all right now we're going to go ahead and we're going to take our I, I like my tap follower we're going to put that in here and uh, then we'll be able to move this piece of material around and we're just we're not going to clamp it down or anything else it's pretty firm on the end and we're just going to take and we're going to zero in on it and then we're going to come in with the center drill and drill it so all right i got my crescent wrench so i can bring this right on down close here so I'm, i don't have to move this handle too far to actually uh come down here and actually see if i'm lining up and uh just looks like a little tiny bit all right that's going to be close enough i can take and The center drill is somewhat going to follow that and I'm going to be extending this quill out quite a ways so it'll self follow as, you know, on its own that way as well. You start learning a little bit, if you're reaching out, your, your, your worn or used spindles will follow. Alright, we're in high speed. All clear, good to go.
I like that. Almost, almost a little, almost too far, but that was good. Got a good uh, size center drill in there. We're going to be cutting this in. We're going to be probably cutting a little bit off of each end. We're about an inch overall, maybe a little bit better than an inch overall on our length, uh, extra long from what we measured. jaws to the four jaw right off the bat is uh, that we were chucked on and that relatively holds this section right here um, pretty close to round and we know we're within at least a 30 second on our center drills and we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna take a light skim just to where we got round diameter here with this center then we're gonna endo it and then we're gonna do and we're gonna flip flop back and forth until we have a, a a medium quality true running part this time of year we got plenty of stock well we got the head stock we got the tail stock and then we got the wood stock well since uh oh I don't know October we've we've burned a little bit uh, that back fence had a little bit in there behind where the welder is and uh, we're, we're lined up all the way to the back door of the house and uh, then we're all the way from the shed behind the the shop as well and our rack is pretty well full here but uh, you know we do when it uh, when it's gonna get nasty like tonight uh, we're going from rain which we got rain right now and we're supposed to have the first snow drop and then it might go back to rain and then it's gonna freeze here for two days so, you know, that means, you know, have, have some wood inside. I burn green, wet wood. And I get 724 burn in, uh, in my wood stove. And uh, I can throw 20-inch logs in there, about four of them. And, I mean, you see, I, I don't, I don't over-split my wood. And uh, a couple pieces of this are drying. That's why I brought it in here. Uh, just in case anything ever snuffs out or first thing in the morning I like to put a few dry ones in and uh, and then I bring in a few dry ones during the day when uh, the stove is going it dries out real fast here and it's ready to light uh, so you keep the continuous burn going alright back to our job alright we're switching out we're, we're taking out our C&M P's and we're gonna put in a C&M G uh, we we want to go ahead and we want to run a negative. Uh, we're going to be hogging off some material here. And uh, we do like the, the positive inserts for finishing. And when it really comes to roughing off and doing this hard shell on the outside, negative insert always has seemed to be more beneficial than a positive. That's kind of what we're going to go with. All right. to uh, our insert here instead of instead of pushing it straight in um, I think it tends to add it not so much uh, it gives more back clearance back here and uh, it, more positive pressure on the leading edge and it seems to to work out as well also um, so it's kind of this is my starting this is my go-to starting point anyway all right now we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna uh, get her going we're gonna touch off and we're gonna see how she's handling it and then uh, we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll get some feed going here. And we're going to go ahead and give some oil to the ways here. And I squirted a little bit down here on my lead screws because they tend to be a little dry. About 17, about 17 thousandths on our feed rate. 
and our speed we're about 133 bit of chatter. Alright, we get our, our ventilation on here. switch over to a uh, uh, CNMP, a positive uh, insert. The negative was giving us a little bit of chatter here at the beginning, so we got a couple more passes here to make, and then we're going to endo this uh, bar. We're just shooting kind of somewhere around the four and a half inch mark. Okay, we're getting a, getting a few chips here. I'm just going to take a wad out here to the trash. Whew. Really, it's pretty nasty out there. Rain. We're supposed to change over to snow tonight. Then back to rain. Then two days of freeze. So, I know I had a comment there that one of the guys was from the mid uh, Midwest there. He's got a hard time keeping the temperature up. Once you get all your equipment hot, um, I, I burn green wood. So I keep that fire going all night, all day, all night. Um, it's the only way that you can have enough warmth in the shop so you're not fighting getting it hot, getting it, you know, and then, excuse me, letting it cool down. Um, because uh, I come out here in the morning and it might be 72 degrees in here and uh, of course it's below 30 outside warm handles make me happy my trick to keeping warm handles anyway we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna make another another pass here where we sped it up and we're we're our feet rate we're clipping, we're clipping along at about 25,000 for the revolution right now. And our speed is about 450. Thing in for him, and 
going to lightly find out where the center is here now. I put this in neutral so we can spin this easy. And get just a little bit of clamps here. Relax the center just a bit. Move our oil can so we don't trash it out. I can just see that it was lifting a little bit more over here. Okay, it's pretty close to center. We should be able to handle it a little bit slightly off one way or the other. <clears throat> trying to clamp on that I'm just trying to bring it down to where it holds it as close as possible and um, now we're going to go ahead and bring our center back in here but we want to make sure there's no debris in there <clears throat> now the three jaw should be holding Three jaws holding that relatively close to where the center was. And now that we turn this around, <clears throat> we're going to be gaining a new cut on here, which would, should be true with this center. And whatever idiosyncrasies we find here, or because we were held out here on the rough um, uh, casting of this part. So we're going to be switching back and forth a little bit here, but in the very first two cuts here, we eliminate most of the run out of the OD of this thing. So I'm going to go ahead and tighten this up here now. One thing we didn't do, we didn't face off the end of that, which would have made that set to chuck a little nicer. Um, we're touching over here, and we got a gap over here about an eighth of an inch. Uh, it really shouldn't affect the operation, but we should have made, we should have done that before we turn it around. But the next time we come around, we're going to face this one. And we'll turn it around one more time, and we'll face that one off as well. Um, doesn't mean that we're facing it all the way down to the center. Eventually, we will. We'll have to take some off. Uh, this shaft is actually uh, an inch and I don't know an inch and a quarter something like that longer than it needs to be All right now we're going to go ahead and we're going to switch back to our negative uh, insert just because I it handles the pounding much better than this positive insert, but this positive one let us get up to about Oh, 530 surface feet a minute uh, is where we ended up traveling uh, with this. I punched it in the calculation, uh, the calculator, and and uh, I was I'd be, I was kind of curious at how much I was actually turning and getting a pretty good chip that came off gold but turned blue on the pile. All right, and that's pretty. Uh, that's 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 a good number. Um, I've always pretty well held the 500 surface feet a minute on steel and about a thousand on aluminum. And there's, you know, general tool bit without lubrication. I 
imagine some of the high tech industry and stuff like that is way overdoing that. So I'm not. I'm just stating what I'd normally practice. That's all. Now, it, that same speed and the same feed with the negative tool bit, I mean, I got through the crust. I'm going to go ahead and switch this over now to the positive. Because the positive tool bit will cut it with less vibration or harmonics um, that, that caused by uh, the negative rake. Um, for, you know, I'm just kind of, what I, what's playing with on my lathe right here, right now, is I am, uh, and this is going to be a close-up. All right, and you can, you, I mean, you know, when you start getting uh, harmonics uh, in your in your part, and your your it's actually vibration throughout the whole machine, and uh, you know, I'm I'm sitting here on a water table, like most marine you know applications, and uh, this my slab is a very very old non-stone slab with a lot of cracks in it, and I got this lathe sitting on two plates of steel kind of holding it up um, and supporting it. So when I do get into some things like this, I have a little bit more uh, vibration problems than the average uh, lathe that's anchored down to a good floor and everything. Um, so anyway, I'm gonna switch this over to the positive tool bit and uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna get going on some of this because this, compared to this surface, see that's the same depth cut with the positive tool bit and where it was chattering here before it's cutting smooth now it still has a slight bit in there 